you know, one of the key issues is moving forward is we have to figure out how are we going to feed every single person on this planet without expanding agricultural land. We've got a given set of agricultural land out there today. We have to not only feed 7.7 .7 billion people on that, we have to feed 10 billion people by 2050. And that's where food waste comes in, you know, because food waste automatically comes back to land and how you use the resource and we have to use them a lot more you know, efficiently. How we actually produce the food, producing food a lot, lot more efficiently on that land is something that we're going to have to do to be able to make sure that we're not cutting down more trees, which increases greenhouse gas emissions, increases biodiversity loss and so on and so forth. Um, dietary shifts tends to impact, uh, it tends to impact greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs>
in Borneo and the Dayak uh, uh, culture, indigenous people there. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yeah, yeah I forgot that story about Bon and uh, <laughs> Bill in Argentina coming up and saying that we have to be careful what we say. You know, I, I I almost get that on a daily basis, and that's one of those things that that you know continues to. Um, it's very interesting just how controversial discussing food can actually be and how divisive you know it brings us together at one level you know we sit around tables we share meals we have great conversations but on another level it actually divides us and puts us into camps when you eat meat or you don't so yeah 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 that was a fun, <laughs> that was a fun story um uh so my genesis yeah it's it's interesting because it feels like my path to get here it's like all roads were leading to this point right um, I worked in education for many years, actually, was a headmaster for um, a bit, founded a school, taught physics and chemistry. Um, and I think that bit helped me to um, a lot with the education side of the work that I'm doing right now, because I think a lot of the academic focus and when, you, when uh, you know, normal academics, they have a very tough time communicating the idea for the audience. You know, that's something that I think is very, it's a moral imperative that each you know, one of us have to be able to be able to take the science and be able to communicate it in a way that everybody can actually make sense out of. But then after that, I went to Borneo. Um, I switched from education, uh, worked, in, um, worked in Borneo for almost about five years. And what I was doing there is I, uh, well, I naively went in there thinking I wanted to, I was going to save rainforests and save orangutans and clouded leopards. And boy, this is going to be easy. And I quickly found that just is such a complex beast trying to solve this, this, this complex problem of working with local communities, economic development, uh, education, conservation, and the intersection of all those coming together. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, it, you know, what I ended up doing was I ended up getting a PhD while I was there because I realized that I was uh, woefully um, ill-equipped to be able to do the work that I wanted to do. Uh, so I got a, a PhD in working on how to actually work with local communities and um, uh, work on development issues while at the same time actually protecting forests. Yeah, so I lived with the Dayak for almost five years, uh, researched uh, orangutans and clouded leopards and monkeys and worked on education issues, development issues. Um, but what I started to realize there was just how tricky it was to work with a single community and to bring a single community along that process from development and conservation and being able to wrestle that and all the complex issues that you're trying to um, that you're facing. I mean, it's this it's this absolute chessboard of all these players coming in. You know, the palm oil companies, the coal companies, the conservation organizations, the local community trying to figure out where they sit in the middle of all this, right? And I began to realize that if we were to do this for every single community on the planet, this is going to be a really hard task. We were underfunded, under-equipped, under-resourced, and you know, I just felt like what we had to do if we were to solve the great grand challenges that we were facing was we were going to have to do it at a much larger scale. In addition, I went in wanting to protect orangutans and clouded leopards, thinking I'm going to protect these animals. Everybody wants to protect them. I mean, who wouldn't want to protect, you know, orangutans? They're so cute and cuddly, right? <laughs> but, but, you know, I quickly came to realize that for the local communities, that's not their number one priority. It's education, it's jobs, and it's health. And a lot of the conversations that we actually de dealt with came back to food. It's these food issues. It's, it's, it's about feeding and making sure that, that the kids are healthy. And with the Dayak, a lot of their culture is tied to food. The harvesting of the rice and the seasonal harvesting of the rice and the village coming together to cut down areas of the forest in some areas, to plant rice, to harvest it together, to sing songs together. Their ceremonies all involved food in some way. Everybody had their own. Um, garden and, and they where they grew fruits and vegetables and you, you know everything else but they were quickly losing that as the palm oil plantation started to come in so even the conservation issues were directly tied back to the food issues and what they were interested in is more about how do we protect our culture 
which is directly tied back to food. And then the palm oil, which is a food, was also impacting the forests. So there was this intersection of all these issues about cultural preservation with economic development, with wildlife conservation, and what was at the center of all of it? Food. So what I quickly realized, um, well, maybe not so quickly, but what I realized over time is that I, I could actually achieve the same conservation outcomes by talking about food. I didn't have to directly talk about orangutans. I didn't have to directly talk about saving forests. I could, I, I could talk about food and, 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 and issues with food. And I thought, well, maybe if I started to work on this issue at a global level, we could achieve the same conservation outcomes, the same health outcomes that we could have, that some organizations are actually working on, but by actually focusing on one of the most important problems out there today, and that's food. Uh, so that's why I, I moved to eat. And I started to work at the international level and to realize that we started to actually work at that level to influence local communities and the processes that were happening. Um, and uh, from there, I went to WWF because WWF is a global organization in 87 countries. You know, I realized that to be able to achieve this, we need large organizations that, could, that are working on the ground everywhere. Um, and uh, that's, that's, that's where I am today. I really appreciate you <clears throat> telling us that story because it's so vital and there's uh, so many things that pop out of that. So also in your bio, you nicely address the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement. But what food is, is the basic uh, physiological needs of humanity, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's so our basic needs and sustainable development basically is an infrastructure it is those basic needs so when you're at that that very bottom level of of indigenous cultures or cultures around the world they're worried like you said about health and education and the basic needs like food and those conservation things kind of if those basics are met and they're done right then the conservation can happen oh. then the, the 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 sustainable happens and so i uh I've also run into that enlightenment as well. And I, 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 it's just fabulous to hear your story on that connection. I want to tie it to two other things as, as we progress through now. Um, you've, you've had all these years of experience. You've been dealing with food. You're uh, the, the, one of the lead authors on uh, the Eat Lancet report. You've been with Eat, but you're, you're also now on this global level but you've been doing this for a while. You've spoken at all different levels and seen different cultures and people and, and the discussions around food. And then 12 months ago, you know, I, I don't know, uh, uh, even more now, um, we, this craziness hits our world. We've got a pandemic, we've got COVID, we've got Black Lives Matters, we've got racism against Asians, we've got Brexit, we've got an inauguration and probably on and on it just is, it's like this big ripple effect of what's going on in the world. And my question is, one, how have you and your family weathered this time? I, I kind of know, but we all want to hear. And is all that that you spoke about, all that wisdom, all that learning, a better operating system, a better model for life to, to give us a little bit resilience to get through these hard times, times of pandemics, times of extreme nationalism and, and the division of humanity are there some learning lessons and have you also seen a doubling down of humanity and those people you speak to or work with are trying to reach now saying wow we are we realize we need to really focus in on these basics and focus in on food and these bigger issues that all tie to this basic infrastructure and so i want to know how, how have you weathered and are there some learning lessons some better models of resilience maybe out of that time um, that, that you've learned over this period of craziness? Yeah, it has been a year plus of craziness, right? Um, and I think that very few things has touched almost every single person on the planet such as this. Um, yeah, I guess some, a few things pop to mind. And you know, number one is this idea that everything comes back to food. You know, a lot of the issues in terms of where this came from and where this pan, like where this pandemic actually, you know, originated, the source of it, could come back to food. It could be a wet market. Um, could be the relationship that we have with trading wild animals. You know, and bushmeat and 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 um, 
you know, we know that the more that we encroach on some of these areas, the more that we bring in humans and wildlife and livestock interaction, we're creating the right environment for this to, for these emerging diseases to just kind of emerge and just take over. And we've realized the impact that that can have. So I think it's been a wake up call to one extent. Um, it's also been a wake up call because it's demonstrated the fragility of the global food system as well too, because there's a lot of people out there that the food system has been broken. They weren't able to get access to markets. They weren't able to get their food. Um, but it has also showed, you know, people are also cooking more at home. They're, I think banana bread or certain types of breads where, where they're like the rage and everybody makes food together and our family's coming together more now to make food. Um, you know, so I think, you know, food has absolutely been the center of so much of the past year. And I think that the pandemic has definitely elevated it to a new level, uh, which is a very good thing. Um, you know, you mentioned nationalism, I think is another um, idea and like local food systems and everything. You know, there's been this emergence of more like a nationalism, domestication of food systems. You know, we want to nationalize food system, which is good to one extent. But to another extent, um, that can have detrimental effects for some people as well, too, right? And, and, and we have to be very careful about making sure that, you know, as, as, we, as we look towards what we just weathered, that we don't look more inwards and outwards. Um, because the only way that we're going to be able to fix the global food system is to actually cooperate more, to probably increase trade of food, to actually make sure that every single person on the planet has access to food. Um, and that's going to mean some local food production, but a lot of global food, actually, um, that, that, that we're going to have to trade. And we're going to have to make sure that moving forward, we create a system that is resilient and can weather these sorts of storms. Um, I think through this past uh, year, the food system has done not too bad. Uh, it's definitely impacted some areas more than others, um, but we can definitely do it much better moving forward. Um, yeah, but overall, I would say me and my family have weathered it fairly well. Um, I was traveling way too much before, my God. You know, I, I think all of us were. My, my last trip was to a G20 meeting in Saudi Arabia in uh, Riyadh. I went there for 24 hours, gave a 15-minute talk, and flew home. You know, and when we start to think about how crazy that is that we would fly to a meeting like that to give a 15-minute talk and fly back, I think we start to think that it, it, almost the insanity of some of our actions, right? It, it just doesn't make any sense anymore. So hopefully there has been this transition, this you know awakening among businesses, among all of us working on these issues that we can actually have these conversations like this, right? And that these conversations that we can do a lot uh, through these virtual platforms. Um, and the flip side of that, we can't replace human contact. Uh, I still do a lot of talks online, a lot of Zoom presentations, and I really hate them. <laughs> I do because you're speaking to a computer in your living room and you, do, you, know, you can't see how like the words flow over the audience and how it catches and how it resonates and the reaction to that. And the only way that you can get that is uh, through human contact with people. You know? So we're also going to have to moving forward balance you know, when do we have to come together and when can we actually meet like this and have these same sorts of conversations like this. Um, my hope is that moving forward, we don't just have almost like a revenge, got all this pent up energy that we just want to get out now, um, you know, revenge travel and, you know, everything else. But I hope that we do, uh, that this has demonstrated a better way of living and we can maintain it going forward. I'm skeptical that we can, uh, but at least we have a vision out there about what more we can do. Yeah, the, this revenge travel is almost like trying to make up for, you know, missed opportunities, missed vacations, missed, uh, missed meetings, you know, and uh, I, I hopefully the, the majority of the world has come to the realization a lot of those times that we've, we've, we spent, we're, we were spinning our wheels and those, not all those meetings needed to happen live and, and in present. I also traveled a lot like you and, and, you know, it's crazy. I'd spend more time in, in um, taxi or airplane in a hotel and waiting to to go on stage to talk and then you know just turn around right after and, and and go out and there was no extra time to meet and greet people to kind of network to kind of uh 
experience the whole event and listen to the other talks. And so a lot of it was very shallow and superficial and, and uh, not a lot of meetings. So I think there's definitely some better models that we can learn and improve on that. I, I also kind of, uh, you know, I don't know if there was any other specific things where you say, you know, not only have I been speaking about this and working in this for so many <clears throat> decades um, around food and around conservation, but I actually applied some of those principles to my life, the way I ate, the way I looked at uh, certain infrastructure, certain things. And I realized that during the pandemic, me and my family, and, and uh, uh, there was some extra bonding, some better, it was kind of a better model that, that, that went through and was able to carry us better through and weather this crazy time a little bit better than I, than I saw others or any kind of kind of learning wisdoms. And, and the reason I, I asked that is because I've also seen the flip side. Some of those other speakers, some of those other leaders or futurists that, that we've seen around the world in some of our meetings, some of them were hit pretty hard. And all, all that, that came out of their mouth was words and speaking, and, and they didn't actually apply it to their life. There was no actual, and, and they're like, gosh, I don't have any money, and I don't have any advance, and I didn't, I didn't prepare. I didn't integrate that into my life because they were just going from one meeting to the next or just you know, uh, speaking about it in different ways. And so there was a lot of lear learning lessons on both sides of those errors in the systems or those problems, those cracks or leaks in our system that bubbled to the surface say, oh, we definitely need to fix that moving forward. The one that I like the best is the doubling down of the US when they, you know, when Biden and, and Kamala Harris got into office, they really kind of doubled down and, and went back into the Paris Agreement and doubled down on sustainability and have done some wonderful things. But one thing that I think that's that 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 missed out in, in a certain way, and I don't want to get too political, is the first thing I would have made sure that is getting fixed is the uh, voting system. I mean, since Al Gore in 2000 with Dimple Chats, you think we'd have that whole system a little bit better and fixed. And the same thing is instead of going back now as we come out of this pandemic into some other uh business as usual or so, the old models that don't work we should get those fixed and move forward so we can draw down our, our things so that's why i'm kind of hoping that uh, you can maybe share another story or tell us oh yeah there are some better models for life some better operating things that some some tools that we've got here that really work and they've been proven during this time yeah that's yeah i mean <laughs> I mean, for me personally, thinking back over the past year, um, it's been nice to slow down. It's been nice to slow down and just have more time to re reflect and be still and not to be always on the road and always uh, looking for the next event. And I mean, you know, still busy, but busy in a different way, but also at the same time, teaching myself to be a lot more present. And I think that could serve all of us well moving forward in terms of how do we actually sit down slow down a little bit and be a little bit more present just in the here and now. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, and I'm hoping that as awful as this last year was, it was also an opportunity for every single one to figure out what works for us, what, what we miss, what we don't miss, and what we can actually hold on to moving forward. Um, I hesitate a bit in terms of, uh, um, you know, saying there's one model over the other that could potentially work better. I guess I'm um, you know, I think there's multiple models out there that that really work really depending on places. Um, you brought up the like the US example. Um, I worry about democracy and I worry about the fact that uh, uh, is that the best model moving forward given the multiple converging crises that we're facing right now. Um, uh, I believe in the long term it is, um, but we don't have uh, centuries to be able to figure it out, to be able to make the mistakes. Uh, you know, this like the next decade is the most, you know, consequential decade for our species ever, period, without a doubt. Uh, and we don't have time to be thinking about elections in terms of like who's going to be in office for the next four years and if Biden's going to make it and everything, you know, we just have to hit really hit the ground running. Um, so, so yeah, there are some definite concerns moving forward. Um, 
you know, it'd be interesting to hear from your listeners too. Um, and I'm not sure if you have any sort of like blog or online chat or anything like that, but you know, what have they done over the past year that's worked for them? You know, what are some of the learnings that, that, uh, that they've made? Um, uh, yeah. So reflecting back, I mean, it's, it's been a, not, a, not all bad, actually, not all bad. I'm all, I'm almost dreading when we have to start hopping on the planes again to start traveling. And I, and I, and I don't envision that I'll ever go back to that again. Not as much as I was doing before anyway. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the general emergence right now. It's uh, those who have begun to travel. I have a lot of colleagues in Israel and, and Singapore and different parts of the world that have already started back on the travel and, uh, and doing events and um, speaking about diff different subjects on food. And... <clears throat> And they're doing it in a different way. They've realized that not everybody is willing to, to go back to the way it was before. There was a lot of things that weren't not necessary and could be done differently. That brings me to probably uh, what, what a big question that, that I ask all my guests. And it's really uh, kind of your thoughts and feelings about global citizenry and how would you feel about a world with uh, the removal of borders, nations, divisions of humanity, one from another. And I just for a little more clarification, I kind of tie that together during this pandemic. Food was a global citizen. Obviously, COVID was a global citizen. Air, water um, uh, was a global citizen. And obviously, species uh, aren't held behind borders. But uh, a lot of nationalism, a lot of people going back to, to, to good, positive local economies, local uh, futures of uh, food economies and food webs, community food webs. But how do you feel or how would you feel about a world without borders, uh, global citizenry, um, uh, humanity was connected one from another and that we all kind of like the sustainable development goals uh, had this higher level of goals and operating system that says we'll never let humanity get below that level again. And maybe you could elaborate and tell us your thoughts and feelings on that. It's an interesting premise um, to explore. I guess my first reaction is I don't I don't think I'd like it. I I I like the diversity on the planet. I like the fact that. Uh, traveling from Sweden to Norway is so vastly different when you wouldn't think it is in like in the you know Nordic countries um, to be able to go to different parts and places and uh, um, have that diversity just like with foods I think I think ecosystems or foods or whatever it is I think I think I think diversity is absolutely key the 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 challenges though I think then is <clears throat> Um, how do we move away from those nationalistic tendencies that we're heading towards? And I, and I think that is a bit of a scary uh, path that we're on right now in terms of look more looking inwards than outwards. Um, so if we can maintain those borders while at the same time uh, increasing collaboration and increasing uh, trust and increasing uh, this, this notion of we live on this planet together and we have to start working together, I, I think that, 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 that would be great. That would be my vision. You know, it's like maintain those borders increase collaboration. It's like SDG 17, right? It's 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 drawing on in, asking people to work work together more. Um, but that's 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 not where we're heading right now. We're actually heading in the opposite direction. Um, uh, and uh, we're going to have to figure out somehow how to pull back from that and reverse course. Yeah, I, I believe it was during uh, this lockdown period, but correct me if I'm wrong, you came out with a, a wonderful TED countdown animation, Foods of the Future. Was that during this time or was it back yeah, before? Future of Farms. Yeah, the Future, future farm. of Farms. Uh, yeah, yeah, there was a TED countdown conference uh, last October and uh, yeah, it, it, it was for that. Beautiful. Um, tell us how that evolved and why you decided to go strict with animation and how has it been received and, and um, what are you hearing of that? Was that also in conjunction with the WWF? Yeah, um, I actually started working with Ted on that uh, while I was at EAT, um, developing this concept about what the future farm would actually look like. Um, 
And they wanted to put together, as they were developing their program, some different, some, like a very visual representation of what this forum looks like. Um, instead of just having somebody go up on stage and talking about it, actually giving somebody that they can visualize it in a, in a, in a way that, uh, uh, that they could connect with. Um, so they had a great animation team. Um, so I worked with them on writing the script, worked with them on some of the animation, uh, what we should be focusing on, what the key and main messages were for that. Uh, and so far it's been received very well. I mean, we're, we're pushing a million views so far, uh, which is um, not, not too bad. Um, when you're talking about a farm, you know, like the future farms, um, uh, you know, but what we wanted to do with that was really to give audience and people this notion of, you know, what does the farms of the future look like? It's not just monocrop. I mean, I'm from Iowa, Midwest. I'm a, I'm a Midwest boy, you know, farm boy, you know, and it was corns and soybeans and monocrops and that's what I knew, right? And we wanted to um, really show people that there is a different way. There is a different type of farming that we can actually have that is nature positive, that works for people, works for the planet, uh, is good for biodiversity, and actually produces more food than what we have now. Um, so that's that's the vision that we're trying to create there. It, it was absolutely beautiful. I've watched it a few times, and uh, uh, as well as some of the other countdown things. But I, I, I get the feeling that it just reaches so many more people because it's not really an, an age specific thing. It's visually, even though it's an animation, beautiful. The narration, the story behind it, kind of the journey it takes you on is it, it makes a lot of sense. I, and I've met others who have really enjoyed it as well. So. I think I, I think that's uh, absolutely beautiful. Um, there are some other things that, whether it was eat or before, that you've kind of had the uh, ability or, or fortune to kind of touch upon and be involved in. But I want to go a little bit deeper. Um, so not only with eat, there's the Stockholm Resilience Center, and then there's Johan Rockström and the Planetary Boundaries. <clears throat> um, we hear in our, our time and age, uh, many, many different things. So we hear donut economics. We hear planetary boundaries from Johan Rockstra. Matter of fact, his Netflix movie, Breaking Boundaries, and his book just came out of, I just finished it, a fabulous book, Breaking Boundaries. Um, then we hear about um, Mariana Matsukata, Mission Economics. Then we hear about Ellen MacArthur, Circular Economy. And I, I'm wondering if I'm leaving any out, there's probably a couple others, you know, that, that we could bring up. How, how are we down there? I'm personally uh, set on planetary boundaries. I'm personally thinking those are also in alignment with donut economics, but out of all these different choices, are they all competing against each other going in different directions? Are they all moving in the same direction or is it all this big collaboration? And as the, this global organization and, and being the lead uh, a food scientist there, can you kind of help us how we can make sense of that? And, you know, what should we be thinking about? Should we be thinking about planetary boundaries and how that ties into food and, and going those things? Or, or, is that, or, or just your personal thoughts or feelings are kind of a little bit better understanding? Because I know you, you've said before that you kind of like that uh, line of thought. Yeah, you know. There is a lot out there. And I think that um, just like when you're talking about uh, what type of diet is best for people, people get very confused, you know, or, or, or you'll throw out a term like uh, uh, sustainable food. What the heck does that mean? You know, I mean, you ask one person and they think it's something, you ask somebody else, they think it's something that, you know, this. Um, you could probably survey, you know, an audience of 100 people and ask them, what is a, what is a healthy diet? And they'd give you 99 different answers, you know, so. So it is absolutely confusing. Um, same with all these different systems that we're talking about, but they're all generally pointing in the same direction. This general principle of living within <clears throat> the boundaries of the earth, understanding that we don't, it's not a finite resources that we can continue to extract and exploit and uh, degrade and do whatever we want with. I mean, those days of thinking like that are gone. Um, and, you know, whether you're talking about, I mean, you listed quite, um, you know, four or five there, they're all generally saying the same things. I personally like the planetary boundaries concept because it's built upon decades of Earth, of this Earth system science. And so it's not just some concept that just kind of came out in 2009, Johan and 
um, Will, Stefan, and others just said, hey, let's just think about planetary boundaries. What they did is they said they looked back at Earth system science, which is one of the oldest sciences out there, which studies the planet and, and, and what are the systems that govern all the processes and maintain the stability of the planet. Um, and they identified that these are the main systems that actually do it. These are the, it's the climate system, it's the land system, it's, it's, uh, it's this biosphere and this, all the biodiversity that we have, it's the biogeochemical flows. It's so all these things working together, maintain a stable earth. Now, why that's important actually comes back to the video that I made, this you know, future of farming video, because thank God that we've got a stable earth because over the last 10,000 years, this stable earth has allowed us to thrive as a species been able to create, we've been able to farm, we could predict the seasons, we could do all the things that we wanted to do because we had a, st a stable climate. We, you know, we didn't have fluctuating temperatures like we do right now. Um, and that's allowed us to thrive as a species. You know? So what the planetary boundaries sets forth is, well, what are the systems that we need to operate within to maintain that stability, to allow us to continue to thrive? Um, and uh, it's a very elegant concept and it's weathered the storm. Um, and I think over time it's increasingly getting stronger and more accepted, not less. And that's, that's how these things go. It's, uh, it's definitely highly criticized, um, but that's the process of science and what science goes through. People will criticize it, they'll, they'll, they'll throw stones at it, um, they'll say it's no good, but in the end, uh, it's, 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 it's one of the most elegant ideas out there. Very simple, very elegant, and it works. Yeah, I, I really like it. And, and like I said, I'd recommend that Breaking Boundaries book from Johan, and I believe his name is Geoffrey or Geoff, that uh, was also part of that as well. And, and it's just a fabulous book, and it really explains the, the nine planetary boundaries, how it came up. It takes us from the Holocene right into the Anthropocene and, and what state we're in and how we can remain in that safe operating space. This really brings me to your role with the WWF as a lead uh, food scientist and global uh, lead food scientist, where you, the WWF normally think, okay, we're a wildlife fund. We're doing a lot with orangutans and elephants and endangered species and, and all, yeah, all, all sorts of anim <laughs> animals, wild animals, animals. And um, what does that have to do with food, which you addressed? You already answered when we were talking about Borneo and, and the things you, 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 you said there. And most people hopefully will make that transition and that connection. But on your website, on, on the things, the WF uh, providing super food tools, super, how can you create your own uh, planetary plant-based diet, other diets, and, and kind of move towards a better way, see and, and look at food waste, just some tools, great animations, great things on the website. And I would love to know, what have you been involved in? How, how do you see that going? What do we have to, to look forward to and what's, what, what's maybe coming? And how are you guys all tied into this wonderful new, new thing since uh, last year, the UN Food System Summit and, and what's going on there, which is really pinnacle for food as well in, in this time and age. Yeah, boy, a lot there. <clears throat> yeah, so you're, I mean, you're spot on. You know, WWF is known for protecting animals, right? And that's that. That's really our core goal is is protecting animals and landscapes and conserving these uh, um, these um, iconic areas. Um, I think that less people would think about uh, food and the, and and food when they think about WWF. So even internally, you know, we've we've been working really hard to elevate that and the importance of that within the organization. Uh, but also to ground that within the other conservation goals that we're doing. You know, I, I believe that we might be the only conservation organization that has such a large focus on food. Um, and I think that's, that, that shows the leadership of WWF to be able to take this issue and say this is important uh, because we won't be able to protect forests. We won't be able to save species if we don't change food. You know, because even if we implement these innovative uh, ways of farming, we implement these innovative ways of protecting these areas. If we don't fix the food and the food that we eat, it's still going to drive this increasing demand for land all over the planet, which is going to destroy species, destroy landscapes, increase greenhouse gas emissions, and you know so on. So you know we can't implement nature-based solutions, which is a buzzard right now, 
uh, if we don't focus on food. So that's what we're trying to establish within WWF and also to take that message outside of you know, WWF, that connection between conservation and food. Very much going back to my time in Borneo in terms of how all of these issues comes back to food. Um, but we are, boy, flat out right now with the work that we're doing. Um, uh, we just launched a report last October called, uh, uh, it's called Bending the Curve, the Restorative Power of Planet-Based Diets. And what we did with that is we wanted to take the Eat Lancet, which provided global targets. And there's a lot of reports out there which provide global targets, but individual countries have a tough time making sense of what global targets mean for me. So we analyzed and said, well, if you were to transition to different dietary patterns, how would the impacts play out in 147 countries for uh, greenhouse gas emissions, land use change, uh, biodiversity loss, and other things? And we wanted to show the nuance in individual countries and how it's not always a win win situation. How uh, different individual countries are wrestling with certain issues. Like for example, you have got a subset of countries that are still dealing with burdens of undernutrition. That's first and foremost issues that they want to actually, that they have to deal with, right? So by addressing burdens of undernutrition, that could potentially increase greenhouse gas emissions and biodiversity loss if we're not careful. Uh, other countries are dealing with overconsumption. Um, uh, other Countries are dealing with issues of not having enough land, you know, and all of this global jigsaw puzzle of how all this fits together is something that we're going to have to wrestle with. And that's what we did within this report. Um, the UN Food System Summit is another huge uh, um, thing that we're working on. We're actually leading Action Track 3, which is on nature positive production. Uh, I'm also heavily involved in Action Track 2, uh, which is on healthy and sustainable diets working specifically on how do we elevate this idea of, uh, of um, uh, like national dietary guidelines and changing individual consumer behavior all over the planet. So we're developing a coalition, a global coalition to work on that. Um, and that's flat out, you know, this is the first time that the UN has brought together countries from all over the world to focus on food. It's an absolutely monumental, uh, monumental summit, a great change um, in terms of uh, global awareness on this issue. But the UN is a slow process, boy, right? You know, we can't stop there. We also have to start mobilizing business and individuals and individual countries to be able to take that more bottom up movement and, and uh, to be able to create that change while well, this larger, uh, more UN process oriented things are happening behind the scenes or, 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 or at that level and we need things happening at all levels. Um, and, you know, WWF is there. We're implementing programs in you know, individual countries. We've got some um, ambitious research things that we're working on and we're actually tracking working with a, um, 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 groups to track national level progress and how uh, they're working towards food and how they're working towards this food system transformation. Um, so there's a lot of stuff happening within WWF. There's no shortage of uh, work to get involved in. Yeah, well, I, I mean, there's so many, uh, another big thing and why, why I kind of said, how, how are you doing? How have you weathered this crazy time? Because even in 2020, I mean, really the 2020 started out decade of action, really as people were doubling down already there, the year started off with a bang where we're seeing, seeing more ambitions, more historical precedents set on organizations and corporations saying, no, we're, we're going to put in a billion dollars into this earth fund and into this and we want to double down on climate and, and biodiversity and, and uh, soil health and into food and that just these amazing ambitions. Then almost everything came to a halt and a lot of fear, a lot of things bubbled up. But then there was almost this awakening, this uh, humanity, uh, the people I'd been speaking to for years have really doubled down and said, oh, we've got to do more. We've got to raise the bar. We've got to really get on this exponential roadmap and get up to speed with the changes that are going on in our world to avoid tipping points. And so uh, it's amazing how those were those were there. And then we kind of had this this hiccup that was a good wake up call and it let all the, the problems in the systems bubble to the surface that now we can even address better and find out maybe where we were spinning our wheels, but let's have a trigger focus on uh, a laser focus on where we need to go and what we really need to do. And I, I just love it. I love that the WWF is involved in those action tracks and, and, and what you've done 
so far and, and are continuing to do, um, I, ha I have a, a kind of a even bigger question. So this, uh, hopefully most of us can understand this connection between um, deforestation and, and uh, uh, soil degradation, this, you know, in the oceans, we see this food chain. If the plankton are, are bad, if we have too much plastics, if the coral reefs, then it affects the food chain of, uh, of fish in our oceans and things like that. But also the vice versa on the, the biome, soil diversity, the uh, health of our soils and, and the microorganisms there kind of have this trickle up effect to, to the health of our uh, of our of our planet and in Brockstrom's book matter of fact he said we used to have six trillion different species of trees now we have uh, you know less than a trillion probably species of, of trees left on our planet in the Anthropocene and it really culminated all around uh, agriculture and the, the science or the beginning of the innovation of man, planting the seed, tilling, moving rocks, cutting down trees to, to farm, we started getting rid of those species, but we also started impacting our, our soil diversity. And right now we're seeing this big push towards let's heal our soils. You know, there was um, Kiss the Ground and many other documentaries about how we've got to plant trees and heal our soils and a lot of movements going on. But those diversity issues, those soil issues, those microorganisms that we're trying to, to get back to health have a kind of a food chain that go up to orangutans, that go up to those, those minuscule um, bugs and insects and, and species, pollinators clear up to those that are eaten by, uh, you know, the plants that are eaten by orangutans and things. And so I, I really want to know, um, in your conservation is supposed to be about wildlife, but how also are you addressing these big biodiversity, these big biome issues about uh, reversing those things? Yeah, well, I mean, diversity is key. It kind of comes back to that, uh, do you want borders or not? I, I, you know, I think I, I, I like diversity. I think ecosystems like, like diversity and whether it's a tropical forest ecosystem or whether it's a soil ecosystem, you know, diversity is really key. And, and, and we've done a very good job of um, getting rid of that diversity and really relying on only a few crops and a few you know, species. And we're starting to see just a fragility of that kind of system. And, and there is a growing push towards bringing back the diversity into these systems, uh, developing nature positive production where we can actually um, restore soil health, where we can actually um, uh, plant trees in some of these croplands, right? And we, we can bring back animals into the croplands and not keep them out, right? Uh, um, you know, the flip side of that then that we need, really need to work on, um, and I really like to try and push back against panaceas because I, 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 I really believe that there is no panacea. It's much more complex than that, um, is whether those types of farming systems can produce the same sorts of crop yields of other types of farming systems. Um, there's definitely evidence that they can. There's quite a bit of evidence that they can, but we just have to make sure that moving forward that, that as we explore different types of farming practices that we can still feed 10 billion people, that we can still ensure livelihoods and local livelihoods and everything else for every single person on this planet. And it's, and it's not gonna be easy. It's gonna be a retooling of the entire way that we farm. Um, can I ask you kind of, my, might be a technical or might be um, a controversial question. So there's always this discussion, can we feed the 10 billion? Uh, in the WWF's information alone and, and others, uh, just a quarter of all the food we waste every year was enough to feed everybody in the world who's starving. So, the, and, and it also creates a waste of natural resources and has the potential, to, uh, some studies are saying, creates a, a greenhouse gas in and of itself on how that food waste is disposed if it aggregates, it ferments, it can turn into methane, which is 84 times more effective uh, and is a greenhouse gas in the shorter term, um, uh, uh, which kind of creates this ripple effect uh, uh, on food waste. But what if we got these efficiencies in how we produce food and how we farm and those things, that, and even in the home, that, that we don't waste those foods anymore? 
we we're st- are, are are we really seriously still faced with how are we going to feed 10 billion or is this is this a controversial subject or is there maybe some wisdom in there on some new innovations some new things that we could do um to to really do it different than we've ever done it before well there's three different actions that we have to do number one is we have to shift our diets diets you know shifting diets is absolutely key uh, second thing is we have to change how we actually produce food. And the third thing is we have to reduce how much food we actually waste. So all three of those things are tied together and they push and pull different levers. If we're thinking about planetary boundaries, for example, food loss and waste is more of a land use issue, whereas dietary shifts is more of a greenhouse gas emissions issue. Um, so for example, you know, one of the key issues moving forward is we have to figure out how are we going to feed every single person on this planet without expanding agricultural land. We've got a given set of agricultural land out there today, we have to not only feed 7.7 billion people on that, we have to feed 10 billion people by 2050. And that's where food waste comes in, you know, because food waste automatically comes back to land and how you use the resources and we have to use them a lot more you know, efficiently. How we actually produce the food, producing food a lot, lot more efficiently on that land is something that we're going to have to do to be able to make sure that we're not cutting down more trees, which increases greenhouse gas emissions, increases biodiversity loss and so on and so forth. Um, dietary shifts tends to impact uh, it tends to impact greenhouse gas emissions. So I would say it's definitely not controversial what what you're saying. Um, it's all tied together. All three things have to happen if we're going to feed 10 billion people, and if we're going to do it within within the boundaries and within the limits that the Earth actually places on us. Um, and we can't do one over the others now. Uh, the thing about food loss and waste is this is an issue that uh, most people want to focus on more than dietary shifts. It's not very controversial to say let's uh, 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 let's address food loss and waste. We waste so much food, therefore we should stop it. Um, there's very few people that would say no. That's that's something we should keep on doing, right? Whereas whereas dietary change is so much more controversial. That's that's off. As off limits for many people, you know. So they they're fine with addressing food loss and waste. They're fine with changing how we produce food. Those aren't that really that you know controversial. But dietary shifts are. But boy, we need all three to have any any chance of feeding 10 billion. But it's still theoretical. It's still a highly theoretical concept in terms of how we're actually going to do it. So theoretically, it's possible to do this by 2050. Uh, but we're, you know, it comes back to that jo- that global jigsaw puzzle that I mentioned. How do we optimize all the land everywhere and figure out where is the best place to grow this? You know, where is the best land available to do this action on it, to, to grow cows, to grow legumes, to grow rice, whatever it is. Uh, then how do we get it to every single person on this planet? You know, and how do we deal with countries that uh, don't have that much farmland? Um, and how do we ensure that we don't um, use food as almost weaponized food, right? To hold it hostage from some countries if you're some in some sort of trade, trade dispute. Um, so those are all issues that we're going to have to figure out moving forward. But we can feed 10 billion. Well, those are all historical issues too that we've dealt with in the past that have been used in the past that we really need to learn from those uh, as as lessons to probably not repeat those mistakes and and maybe think of how we can come together and do them different in, in a lot of different ways. There are some other, I mean, this it's a highly complex and uh, obviously systemic uh, levers or transformations that need to occur that we need to do, but there's also some other factors that we're still getting up to speed in addressing like the true cost or total environmental cost is, is yeah. a factor that's been left out uh, uh, for a long time. Are we paying for that natural capital of, of water and land and 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 uh, uh, the resources that go in to produce those food, f- foods that are taken away from vital resources and are we using those efficiently and uh, so there it's very complex and we're still working on them a lot that's why I really like planetary boundaries there's another one that I like that I would like to see hybridized or kind of fit into planetary boundaries in some respects and that is the global hectare of the Earth Overshoot Day or the um, globalfootprint.org who, with uh, Matthias Wackernagel and he does the Earth Overshoot Day. And it's all based on this global hectare. And, and according to the day that uh, Germany, matter of fact, I think it was May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, 
normally a day I, I celebrate because I love uh, Mexican food and, and the whole culture, uh, Hispanic culture uh, around that day. But it was the day Germany hit Earth Overshoot Day, May 5th. It was four months and five days into the year. We've already hit Earth Overshoot the day we've gone beyond our resources. And that's based off of 1.6 global hectares, which is replicable per person. If we were to combine that with uh, the planetary boundaries in the form of an economic model, I, I honestly think we're on, on lines in the right direction to kind of keep those balances uh, in our planetary boundaries and come up with a, a new non-extractive economic model that would work for the entire world. Right in line with planetary boundaries and global hectare, you know, I'm a sustainable development goal advocate. You uh, talk a lot about the sustainable development goals. A lot of people think, you know, the sustainable development goals are an add-on to business as usual. You just plug in a goal here and there to business as usual, and that's it. It's, it, it is an entirely new global operating system. It's an entirely new economic model. Basically, we're saying to all humanity, not just the goals, the targets, the indicators, that here's a new operating system. We're gonna raise the bar higher for all humanity and we're never gonna go below that level again. We're gonna stay at 1.5 degrees of warming and, and adhere to the Paris Agreement by 2030. And, and it is a new operating system. It's a new economic model. And some people say, well, is that for cities, countries, governments, who's it for? It's really how we started out our conversation today. It's for the basic needs, it's for those communities, it's for each individual, it's sustainable development, which is an infrastructure of basic needs for every human being on earth. Because in our discussion, we've talked about how are, you know, the Western world's doing pretty good with food and, and infrastructure, but how are we gonna get that food access to those who are starving or, or in hunger or in poverty? that don't have that infrastructure? How are we gonna get that food there and get their local economies stimulated so that they're just getting the basic needs of not just food, but energy and infrastructure of, of clean water and sanitation. And I, I really I, I really think that not only the, the Eat Lancer report, the planetary boundaries, the global hectare, that they're all in alignment with that thinking of the Sustainable Development Goals and Paris Agreement, but one, one last push, I just kind of want to know, do you also see the sustainable development goals like that as well? And, and what if we had this, um, this thing similar, because May 25th, we're recording this on May 19th, but May 25th is the 60-year anniversary of the, the moonshot when John F. Kennedy was in Congress and said, let's put some men on the moon. And they did it, and they did it before the end of this decade. And so now we're at that same point, nine years to 2030, before the end of this decade, let's reach the sustainable development goals. And I, I just like to know your thoughts, what the WWF's doing, and, and if you're feeling uh, is as well, it, is it for each individual, and is it a new operating system for the world? Ooh. Small question, isn't it? <laughs> Small question, yeah. Um, we definitely need some kind of new operating system and probably multiple new operating systems out there. So not just one, uh, whether it's an economic system, it's a food system, it's a, it's a, it's a trade system, it's all of it, right? So, so, so I think we need to look at all the operating systems and how they're currently working and how we can start to um, uh, rein them in a bit. But um, the sustainable development goals, I think, is, I mean, it's one of the most ambitious global agendas that we have out there. Uh, and we have less than a decade now to achieve them. And we're behind on almost every single goal out there. Uh, so we're not making progress on most of them. Um, you know, and I think this is one of my concerns with the sustainable development goals is the fact that there's not uh, there's not a lot of ambition or there's not a lot of incentive for individual nations to actually work towards them. What are they going to get out of it, right? Um, if they achieve some of these goals, they could actually see it, see it working against their current economic system and current, current 
uh, path to development. Um, and I think that's why you're hinting at this new economic system in terms of how we place value on things, right? Um, <clears throat> so I, I love the ambition of the sustainable development goals. Uh, I wish there were some clearer targets within them and some clearer agreements in terms of how we're going to collectively work towards them. Uh, that's why I think the Paris Agreement is such an elegant um, multilateral you know, agreement. It's, it's, it, uh, you know, all the countries came together for a specific target, for a specific cause. Uh, it gave individual countries the flexibility to be able to achieve those targets themselves. Uh, it's almost like a race to the top type type system that we're actually seeing right now of countries almost competing to see who's 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 going to lead this process. Um, uh, and, it, you know, that's 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 why I think the Paris Agreement has is been fairly successful and 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 we're seeing that we might have a chance of actually doing this. Uh, the, you know, the SDGs, we'll see. Um, um, I I definitely hope we can. Um, but I do think that, you know, moving forward, we will need some more specific targets within the SDGs and some more push in terms of being able to hold the individual countries accountable for helping to achieve them. And right now, that's just not there. There, there was a little bit of doubling down, some hope, so hope on the horizon. Um, there's uh, the new advancement and development of science-based targets that help reach the sustainable development goals a little bit more behind that. Um, and obviously there, there's that. that. That's a much longer discussion we can have, but I really appreciate you addressing that. I have four last questions for you, only one more hard one, um, and that is the burning question, WTF, and no, it's not the swear word, although you might have been saying that during these crazy 12 plus months of time that we've had, but it's What's the futures? Where are we going? Where, where should we be looking? And, and I really want to know from you and WWF, what's the futures? What, what, um, what's the roadmap? What's the plan? What do we need to do? Boy, yeah, another tough question because, I, you know, there are multiple roadmaps. Uh, and I think what we need to be working on right now is I think at the global level, we have a very good sense about what we have to do. Um, there are various international agreements, studies, whatever it is that have really laid that forth, whether it's a Paris agreement that says this is a pathway that we have to follow the IPCC and all the work that they're doing, the Eat Lancet for food systems. Um, but what we really need to start working right now is what that means for individual countries. We have to start working in individual countries and downscaling the planetary boundaries, which is a great concept, but downscaling that to what that means for nations and how that's going to play out in individual countries. That's what we did um, attempted to do like a very first step with that um, uh, with that report that we launched last October, where we looked at 147 countries and you know how this plays out. But we have to really raise the ambition in terms of uh, working with every single country, downscaling the boundaries, downscaling the action, downscaling the targets, uh, and supporting countries to really saying this is this is how we're going to have to this is how we're going to be able to you know, achieve this and how we're collectively going to be able to do it. And I, I, th I think that's where all the work really needs to focus um, you know, right now. At WWF, um, you know, we're working both at the global level, but also at the national level. I mean, we're in 87 countries. Uh, so we're working very hard in terms of working with our national level offices and with our regional offices in terms of saying, how, you know, how, what does this mean within your country, right? But WWF can't do it by themselves. We've got to partner with other organizations, health organizations and health ministries and environment ministries and bring all the people together to be able to uh, uh, figure out what it means for, for them. Um, you know, so I would say, uh, uh, yeah, the very important next step is that national level uh, work uh, that, that, that really, needs to, really needs to take place. If there was one message you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that had the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Yeah, when I worked in Borneo, you know, I give a lot of talks uh, and individuals would ask, what can I do to save orangutans? You know, they, they see these tragic pictures of orangutans. Uh, losing their home, forests being cut, and you know they are tragic pictures. It's 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 awful to experience. It's 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 awful to um, even see it in pictures. Um, and they often ask, "What can they do?" 
what can they do to help Borneo? You know, what can they do to actually help these creatures? And I often struggled because it's hard to tell somebody uh, that's sitting halfway around the world what they can do for some other place, right? Um, but this is why I love food so much because I think every single person wants to fit, wants to make the world a better place. They want to leave the world a little bit better uh, way in terms of how they actually found it. Um, and that's the great thing about food is by shifting your diets, you can actually do something that makes the world a better place. It actually makes you feel great. It gives you that agency and that power of the food choices that you make every single day, three times a day, impacts the planet, impacts uh, how many people we can feed on the planet. It impacts the amount of species that are lost. It impacts climate change and it impacts your health. You know, it impacts so many different things just by choosing certain foods over others and being able to choose certain types of dietary patterns over, over others. You know, so if I would say, you know, there's what's one thing that gives you the agency and gives you the power, it's, it's, it's really the food that you put in your mouth. Um, you know, also, in addition to that, um, I think it's also very hard to tell people what to, what to do, right? You, you can definitely shift your diets, but, uh, but there's more that we can do, right? And I think that's where our individual skills have to come into play. You know, so if you're a painter, then make great art. You know, if you're a parent, then uh, do better parenting and teach your kids. If you're a teacher, do better teaching. If you're a policymaker, make better policy. You know, there are multiple things that each one of us can do, depending on what our skill set is and where we are in life, um, that, that, that can absolutely make the world a better place. You know, there is a better way to do it. We just have to go find it. What should young innovators in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make real impact? Figure out what your skill is and, and then uh, double down on it. Um, you know, I think a lot of individuals look at other people and they say, I want to be like that, or I want to do that, or, or, or this is where I want to head, but, it, but it's not where their, where their skill set lies. Um, you know, and I believe that if you're, if you're passionate, um, and if you're hardworking and extremely disciplined and you figure out what skills, what you're good at, what you're not good at, then you can, um, you, you can be successful. Um, but it's not going to be without hard work. Um, you know, people often ask me about hope and, and, and am I hopeful? And I would say, you know, hope is not really my North Star because hope and motivation, they come and go every single day. Some days you're hopeful, some days you're not. Some days you're motivated, some days you're not. And that's where discipline and hard work have to come in. Whether you want to do this, whether you don't, you just got to sit down, you work hard, you do what needs to be done. Um, and working to make the world a better place is not easy. <laughs> it's, it's, there, there are easier things to do. Uh, so if you want an easy profession, this is, this is, this is not probably going to be it. Um, but it's absolutely rewarding. You know, you know, another thing also that we have to keep in mind is the fact that this isn't some sort of race that we're going to win someday. Like by 2030, if we have achieved the SDGs, then we're done. You know, we can wash our hands and say finished because this is going to be a struggle till 2050, till 2100, till 2200. It's always going to be a struggle in terms of that balance between development and sustainability. And it's not going to stop in 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, so this is a definitely a long game that we all have to make sure that we see um, and realize and, and, and pace ourselves for that long game. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Say, so, oh, if I'd have known this back in Borneo, it helped me so much. Nothing. That's, um, a, that's the journey in and of itself or? It's the journey. I, you know, I've done a lot of different things in my life. I've, I've made a ton of mistakes. I tend to jump off cliffs and see where I land. Um, I failed, I succeeded. Um, I, I tend to just see and just learn from those mistakes. Um, you know, so if, so, so if anything, it's, it's, uh, it's continued to be bold and just be curious and, 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 and continue to search and, um, um, the road will take you where it needs to go. So, um, yeah, the journey has really got me to where I am and, and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So 
Brent, thank you so much for letting us inside of your ideas. It's been wonderful to, to speak to you. And unless you have anything else that we absolutely need to know and you want to tell us we didn't get to talk about, I'm, I'm done asking you questions. I really appreciate your time. Well, Mark, thank you so much for this. And thank you for the work that you're doing and just uh, continuing to uh, to to innovate and share these ideas with others. I mean, you know, it's it's we need all of us working together with this. And I really appreciate the work that you have done and are, you know, are doing so. So thanks for the invite. And uh, yeah, it's been fun. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye.